everybody and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our panel on art and science at DragonCon. I'm Lolly DeRosier, a science teacher and biologist, and you can find me on Twitter at underscore adverbia. Hi, I am Celia Yost. I am a painter and a commercial artist. I currently work mostly in the home decor industry, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at MockNot. Hi, my name is Karen Henning, and I'm a visual science communicator and scientific illustrator. You can find me on Instagram at Odd Angel and on Twitter at The Odd Angel. Great. So we come to this panel with lots of different experiences with both art and science, which for a lot of people seem like two really disparate fields. However, um, they really frequently intersect in uh, each of our professional lives. Art and science intersect in different ways, certainly in entertainment that we pursue, especially the kinds of entertainment that happen at Dragon Con and all of the different tracks certainly have elements of both art and science in them. And so I'm really happy that we get a chance to discuss this today. Um, maybe we can start with just talking a little bit about where that intersection happens for each of us. Karen, do you want to start? Sure. Um, the most obvious connection that most viewers may have with me is the work that I do on March Mammal Madness, which is an annual science and educational outreach event that happens each March on Twitter. It has become the largest online science and educational outreach event. And I am now leading a team uh, of four artists, myself and three other illustrators. And we illustrate the combatants, which have the, uh, the mammalian aspect has expanded to include birds and reptiles and, and other non-mammalian combatants. So, we, uh, we get to do a lot of interesting research and interpretive illustrations of all of these organisms uh, as the, the tournament progresses. So I mostly am a fine artist and kind of the way science interact, I interact with that is in the tools that I use. So like I do a lot of things digitally, and, which using a computer. And also in the more traditional sense, there is a lot of sort of systems that you use to make art, like linear perspective is a tool and it is a system that is a way of viewing this world. So I am a middle school science teacher and I use art, uh, specifically I teach biological sciences and I use art to engage my students. A lot of my students find art to be less threatening than scientific investigation. They um, will frequently jump right in when something is more artistic or an activity that they perceive to be more craftsy uh, rather than an investigation. And it, it, I find that it helps to start conversations. It helps to loosen inhibitions and it lessens worry about what the right answer is. So since we're on the topic of art in education, let's talk a little bit about STEAM. Uh, you know, we had STEM for a while, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and then we had STEAM. STEAM is the new hotness where we insert art into science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. Um, do you ladies have any thoughts about that, about what that is maybe on paper versus how that's actually, how that's actualized? Oh, well, I have thoughts. <laughs> tell us, tell us. I have watched the STEM, STEAM transition happen over the years. It would be STEM for a while, then I would see STEAM in some other aspect of, of social media or education. Then it would be changed back to STEM, then STEAM for a week or two, and then it was STEM. I think STEM is the acronym that most people are familiar with. Um, the The big issue with that for me is that the A, which makes it STEAM, makes all the other letters in STEAM accessible to people it wouldn't be accessible to otherwise. It certainly wasn't accessible to me. Lolly, I wish you had been my middle school science teacher because I probably would have had a, a lot better understanding of these concepts 
because of your use of art and what you do. But I didn't have that. So um, my crusade to make the scarlet letter A in STEAM front and center um, is all about accessibility and comprehension and understanding um, because it provides that, that, that connection, that bridge for people who might not have it otherwise. Yeah, I mean, and I really, I run into this sometimes where people get a very mystical view of the arts where it's like, <laughs> oh, it's just this thing that you do somehow. And it's like, no, it's a skill you can learn. And it's a skill that you can apply to other things. You can apply to, I mean, basically just communication and like, well, like if you're talking about like education and learning, like I'm a very visual person. If you want me to understand something, you should show me a picture. Like otherwise I like a wall of text just is not going to explain it to me anywhere near as well as like a good, a good diagram will. Okay, so since you have brought up some of the, because there is a rigor to art, and I think that that is something that is sometimes lost. Uh, you know, people, there's, as, an, as a person who has some art training, but who is not an artist, I find that in conversation with educators about how to incorporate art, there's this concept that either either people can do art or they can't right? That it's a, that it's an inborn talent that either people have or they don't, or that it's very freewheeling, that there's not theory uh, that's rigorous behind art. Can, do either one of you want to talk about some of the theory that comes into your work? Oh, um, yes. This is a very <laughs> big topic though. So you kind of have to decide what you're going to do with it first. Like, I'm probably going to bring this up a lot. Like, really, visual art is about visual communication, and you can be communicating your narrative, you can be communicating space or feeling, or some combination of the above. Um, where you're going to see a lot of this sort of visual rigor is with how art communicates space and like spatial relationships between things. So, that's where you get into perspective, um, where it's like your box and all the lines of the box need to go towards the horizon, otherwise it kind of gets wacky. But you don't have to do that if you don't want to, or if you're not, if that's not your goal. So that's kind of, and I think a lot of that kind of gets muddy for people. Like this is also a very, like a communicating space this way is a very Western point of view. Um, and if your, your main goal is communicating feelings, you might not care at all. You might just be, and that can be like a very personal system that is going to have meaning for you, but not necessarily someone else. So it's like in order to start, I feel like it's very helpful to decide like what your goals are and what exactly you're trying to communicate to your audience. There is a difference between uh, what I do when I'm doing scientific illustration and science art. Both communicate scientific concepts, but the rigors and conventions around scientific illustration are much more specific and stringent and have to conform to specific, they're very standardized. So we're conforming to specific standards in order to communicate concepts visually in the same way. Whereas science art, uh, that's very much what I do in conjunction with March Mammal Madness. We're, we'll be communicating uh, scientific concepts such as adaptations that an animal possesses and how it uses those adaptations, but it's not going to have taken the 10, 12 hours and 14 layers of graphite that the uh, reconstruction of a prehistoric turtle skull took me. Um, and it's, again, it's what Celia said about you have to understand the purpose for which it's being created. And that will in a big way dictate your process. Yeah, whereas I took some anatomy classes at college, and it's like, it is helpful that I understand basically what a skeleton looks like and how the muscles interact. But no one is judging what I'm doing without any sort of rigor. It's more like, here is the impression of it. Don't try and actually use this to study anatomy on. 
Yeah, that is something that I hit on with my students a lot. I work with students who range primarily ages from about 11 to 14. And we talk about looking versus seeing. And, and we use art as a way to uncover things that maybe haven't been visible before. When you put a specimen in front of a student and you tell them to draw it without any other instruction, uh, you get a wide variety of interpretations and, but almost universally, unless they've had training already, they tend to focus on the wrong things. And when we're doing um, art in relation to science class, we're really looking at specific kinds of information. And so uh, by having some very specific direction in the, kind, in the ways that we look at specimens and what we're trying to see about those specimens, uh, close examinations like you would do with art projects really help us to uncover features of those specimens and those relationships that you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, I think maybe this would be a good place to show some work. If that's, if that's sure. um, like, so for example, with my students, I'm going to share just a couple of things I've done with my students. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Okay, so this is a, a mural that the students did of plant cells. Um, and these plant cells were about eight by eight um, pieces. And they, uh, you know, we, every year we do models of cells. We talk about organelles and things like that. But these were constructed entirely out of paper, cardboard, and scrap pieces of fabric. Uh, mm -hmm. All together, there were about a hundred of these tiles that were installed in a mural in one of the school hallways. And what's really interesting about these is that each one is totally unique. But because we were, these were done as part of a unit, there's a sameness about them. There is um, kind of a common language of what these structures are from one cell to the next. The students did not have any other template except for the size of the cell, so the overall boundary of the cell. Um, they did their own interpretations for what the relative sizes and representations of the organelles inside should be. And so I consider this to be an example of a very successful piece where students each had their own interpretation using these found materials and individually they all arrived at the same place. Hmm, and so it cool. made sense to display these um, together um, to kind of talk about like multi, you know, helped us to talk a little bit about multicellularity and the nature of individual cells uh, working together and tissue layers and things like that. So it allowed me to in a way that I hadn't anticipated when we first started. So did building, them. sorry. Go ahead. Oh, did building the cells help them with memory? Uh, so, you know, that is one of the things that the Next Generation Science Standards um, emphasizes is the use of models to explain and to understand um, uh, structures and uh, things, microscopic structures, things that are invisible to the naked eye. Um, so models are, uh, you know, from the research, we know that building models do help students to remember. Uh, what was interesting about building these was there, this was one of the first times I've ever done cell models with students where the emphasis wasn't so much on, is this right? Like, you know, when you have, when you use kits, for example, most of the questions revolve around, is this right? Like, is this where I put this piece? Is this where I put that piece? They're, they're focused on the construction of the object and not their own understanding of the object. So I think in a, in a activity like this, they really were looking at the, the diagrams and images and um, slides that we had seen in class and putting their own interpretation on it, which ultimately what was important. The difference, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> the difference in understanding 
between doing something like this and simply looking at cells under a microscope, which is cool. And I've never turned down an opportunity to do that throughout school, but coupled with something like this, my understanding of everything around that lesson would have skyrocketed. Yeah, same. Because like also, I mean, if you're just looking at a cell under a microscope, if you don't, if you're not a trained scientist, like, oh, here's some blobs. Yes, <laughs> well, right. exactly. Like, I, I do feel like having this extra layer of interpretation really helps, especially if you, you compare it to, it's like, okay, so this blob matches up with this shape and I can see how they interact better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this and this kind of ties into the idea of accessibility, which is something I want to talk about a little bit later. Um, here was an example of we we were doing a cabinet of curiosities, <laughs> and we each student picked an invertebrate species, and so this student picked a nautilus, and she um, she knitted it. So she used yarn and pipe cleaners and little bits of felt, and I I think she used a button for an eye. And, uh, you know, from, from an arm's length, this is a very convincing specimen mm -hmm. uh, with lots of attention to detail that, um, you know, that she probably wouldn't, like, this is, this, she had to think about how these pieces go together and how she was going to take these found materials and constructed materials and put them together in a way that made sense that communicated what this specimen would look like in this jar. And, and that's, that's what I mean about really seeing the object instead of just looking at it, um, really understanding like, you know, what, where these, how these anatomical pieces come together. Uh, this was one of my, one of my favorite specimens that came out of that project. And then real quick, here are some, the two specimens that we did from when we studied angiosperms. I had students, we talked about field sketches and what we do when, we, um, when we're in the field and we don't have cameras to rely on, we have only uh, pencil and paper and our own observations. And, um, but in order to do their field sketch, they first had to construct a specimen and they sure. were allowed to use only paper. So this is a paper um, flower and then this was the sketch that they made and the field specimen that they made out of that. And, and they had two different ways of understanding that same specimen, more than just reading about it or making a PowerPoint and showing it to the class. They had to go through the process of construction of building that specimen from inside out. Um, here's a second one. This is an example where I feel like the 3D construction of it was much more successful than the sketch. Um, so you have a student that was really doing, like really struggled with one aspect of it, but really excelled in the other aspect of it. Both of those experiences are fine. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they got, they got something out of doing that. Um, and then the last one I want to show you is the, the project on science illustration. Uh, we uh, looked at how to reproduce. We looked at how we, we use measurements to reproduce detailed sketches and drawings of organisms. And this was done by a 12 year old um, from, and you can see there, you know, this, the original photograph uh, that was taken by Alex Wild and how they went about transferring that photograph to a gridded paper. And then how they went about using a stippling technique to, um, to fill in the details of that. But through the process of measuring, pausing and measuring and looking at the dimensions very, very closely of this organism, uh, they were able to produce this incredible illustration. So the last piece I want to say about that, and then these are some pieces from high school students. Uh, individual students made each of the, the little coral reef specimens, and then we put them all together. Uh, we did this to talk about the competitive nature of different corals. Um, as they, as they build reefs, um, and, you know, to kind of avoid students thinking about reefs as like furniture under the sea. <laughs> um, they do, cause you know, before they, they kind of just think of them as fixtures that sort of, they're, they're, they think of them more as geological in nature and not as living organisms. Wasn't there an aspect of that project where students who were, um, 
in the later portions of, of putting their contributions on the reef that was being created, uh, came to you and said, well, where are we supposed to put it? There's no room. Yes. And yes. That, that was part, but that was part of the, the lesson. Yes, is, is that that competitive nature of these organisms and how they, they crowd together and they compete and they uh, push each other out. And yes, yeah, the competitive nature of that. It's also interesting to me looking at that is you have all different types of things that are coral, but if you just ask someone to draw a site on scene, a coral, you would probably get like little squiggly branches, like basically the, mm -hmm. very, a very generic item. And here you're getting something that's very specific instead. Yes. And, and this really, I mean, there, and there is no doubt about what this is, mm -hmm. right? Anybody who's even seen a reef in photograph uh, or, you know, in a passing mural or something would know automatically what this is. And I think after this, the students, when they see images or representations or actual coral reefs, would have a much better understanding of the dynamic nature of that reef, of the um, community nature of that reef, the community ecology that's happening there, as opposed to just thinking of it as one big massive structure. Um, and so the last bit I wanted to talk about was accessibility. Um, uh, with the exception of the last picture of the coral reef, which was done with clay, um, most of these projects are done with what starts out as piles of junk. Um, it's, I think a lot of families assume that art is expensive, which it certainly can be, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Um, these are, I asked parents to just clean out their junk drawers to clean out those boxes of gift wrap and clutter and half used bottles of glue and send those in. And that's typically what we use um, to do these projects. That's fantastic. All right, so I've, I've talked a lot, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> um, I can show a little bit about what it is that I do. If I can get this flash drive to show up. <laughs> um, and I think uh, what I'd like to try to do is show, uh, there we go, do a visual representation of what it was that I was describing earlier, which would be um, the difference between scientific illustration and science art. So let me pick a piece that I did for last season's March Mammal Madness and then share my screen. Everyone see that? Okay. So not quite a scientific illustration because if it was a scientific illustration, honestly, I would need to take into consideration where every single scale lays and where the pigment is on, a, on those scales, but it communicates what it needs to. It's a cobra. You can tell from the markings that is a specific species of cobra. This is an Indian cobra. And uh, you don't even need to see the design on the back of the hood to tell that. So this is in one of those gray areas where it communicates a concept, it communicates information about the species, but somebody who was doing a scientific study on either anatomy or adaptations of the Indian cobra, this might not be terribly useful for that. So let me bring up... There we go. This this is a scientific illustration. Now this is the reconstruction of the skull of D. nodosa. It is a an extinct baned turtle. Um, this was actually found inside a jacket that had. Uh, hadrosaur fossil in it, and uh, the preparator saw something off to the side that looked interesting, and surprise, it's a turtle. <laughs> so they, they took it out, 
And this is the first intact lower jaw for the species that has ever been found. So they contacted me to do the reconstruction. Um, and this is where looking and seeing uh, and the difference between those two activities makes a huge difference. If you had asked me before working with this specimen to draw a turtle skull, I would not have put the eye socket here. I would have probably put it back here. Yeah, yeah. Because we don't stop to consider that the part of the turtle's head that we see is about that portion. The rest of it back here is generally under a, uh, a covering of, of skin, very thick skin, that hmm. it then brings it back into when it is uh, retracting that particular part of its anatomy into the shell. So, and it's easier to see here. This is generally the portion that we see. This is where oh. the jaw muscles insert and where that collar of skin would generally be happening. So I needed to make sure that all of my surfaces were correctly textured, that all of the surfaces that were convex and concave were properly um, indicated as such. And this was done by literally sending scans of this back and forth to the lead paleontologist on the paper. And he would send back uh, red line corrections that he had done in Photoshop, and we just kept making corrections until it was what he needed. Um, the amount that I learned about this particular species just from doing the illustrations was phenomenal, and it, it gave me a, a greater interest and a greater respect for, for turtles as a species and what they have gone through over millions of years of evolution. Um, it was, it was really, really cool. That's really interesting. So how, so how do you make the decision? Like referring back to the Cobra picture, how do you make those editorial decisions about what to include and what to exclude? Because I, like for me, I think, I, I think I would fall into the trap of trying to include everything. Again, it depends on what your, your end purpose with the illustration is. It was what Celia was describing earlier with knowing what, um, what kind of communication you're developing this for. And uh, students and participants in March Mammal Madness don't really need to know how many ventral scales the Indian cobra has. Um, that's to, but they need to know what it looks like in order to make decisions about whether it's going to advance in the tournament or not. And for those who can't get to internet connections to do research in advance, sometimes seeing the art come up in real time and knowing what the artist considered important about that animal can give them some clues that maybe they didn't think about. So we as artists have to be really, really careful with the fondness that we have for these species and knowing what we know about the tournament ahead of time, not to forecast. Got it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so that was a like a top aside and um, a bottom view that we were looking at earlier. Yes ventral, dorsal, and lateral. And generally the lateral view would be facing to the left. That's the convention. And I did ask um, the paleontologist if that is how he wanted it. And, and he told me no to go ahead and face it to the right because that was the section of the skull that we had that was best preserved. So that was the side that he wanted to work with. Interesting. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, it's very, that is a very distinct style that you're working in too, because it's very like smoothly rendered. It's not like, a, you're not doing like a line drawing. Mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, like how, do you know how um, scientific illustration like arrived at doing like that particular style of art? Um, it's easy to reproduce. It's easy to scale up and scale down. Um, it, it needs to, be able to communicate something clearly in a way that photos can't. 
um, because no matter how well lit the reference photos uh, he sent me of that skull were, I would still be sending them back with annotations saying, I can't really tell from the light whether this is convex or concave. Um, so doing an illustration where the light source is this nebulous universal light source on everything uh, is done in, in the way that it's done in order to make those kinds of distinctions very clear. Do you ever have issues with photos not showing the correct detail too, just because it's like, it's harder to see in person? All or, the time. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, with photos have their limitations with portions of um, anatomy or organisms in front of other parts, medical illustrators especially run into this where they have to find a way to render transparency mm. or they have to find a way to render something behind something else while still making it visible, even though if you were seeing that or looking at it rather, it, it wouldn't appear to you that way. Um, so they're using a different way of, of seeing to help you as a, as a viewer of that illustration, see it also. So let's, let's bring it back a little bit to, uh, to the entertainment. You know, we're here as part of Dragon Con uh, and we're talking about art as a form of communication. Mm -hmm. A lot of the media that we consume, whether it's high fantasy or science fiction, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't showcase art in a lot of instances, there's probably a few instances where it does, but for the most part, uh, when people think of science fiction, they're not thinking about the art, they're thinking about the science or the, you know, the pew pew or the action sequence or something like that. Where, where do you, can you think of any examples where art in a particular fandom or in a particular medium where the art really shines, really helps to communicate something scientific? I like mean, my go to is always Star Trek. I, I would say everything that Stan Winston works on. <laughs> I'm sorry, who? Everything that Stan Winston works on. He's one of the the um, the major creature creators out there. So he has to think about um, anatomy. He has to think about uh, how things actually work in order to create something on screen, whether it's a, uh, I think the last video I saw from him recently was uh, an actor in a suit and they had uh, built a gorilla suit. So the suit was accurate, the movements were accurate. Now you're having to train your actor on how gorillas move to bring it all together. So there's like several different kinds of art coming together there to put a gorilla on screen where you wouldn't legally or ethically be able to put an actual gorilla on screen. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, those are the things that I immediately think of. How about you? I was, say, I was mostly going yeah. towards um, like book called cover illustration and that's more of a, I guess, a sales aspect though, um, which is probably going off in a slightly different direction. No, we can follow it though. I think that's well, interesting. I hadn't. I mean, it's, it's, me. it's like if you are looking for a science fiction book, you are going to be looking for a book cover that tells you that, hey, there's going to be spaceships in here somewhere, right? And right. like there, there might be an alien planet. There might be, or if it's like fantasy, like there's, there are some wizards, there are some great, like there's a whole, like, Set of symbols and cues that let you know like hey this is the thing that i am buying or this is the genre that i want like there and it's a way of making sure that the media reaches its audience via like the shortest um distance possible yeah what immediately comes to mind is a lot of the pulpy science fiction <laughs> like alan dean mm -hmm. fox foster right like the dime store novel that showed like really weird aliens or strange landscapes and things like that those were so much fun I feel like a lot of covers today have gotten a lot safer like please don't can I can we not look at an astronaut in silhouette or like another <laughs> spaceship in dock like come on like show me something truly bizarre something truly weird you're right uh, I think that's yeah yeah we see that a lot I think for example like the one of the instances where I don't think it was as successful. I remember when Avatar first came out, 
um, blue alien avatar, okay. not like, like which one? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that you know, they they were thinking about Pandora and the type of planet that they, the ecology that they wanted to create, and they're like, all right, vertebrates, but give them six limbs you know yeah. or mm-hmm. or they you know that the their what passes for horses on pandora their nostrils are in their neck which is not that far fetched i was like okay you know there's you know gills in the pharyngeal area you could put the nostrils here but if you're putting the nostrils here why do they have these big long heads still like <laughs> why don't they you know i why don't they have horses with just little cone heads or whatever <laughs> um so so those are the kinds of things that as a biologist kind of pull me out because I'm now more focused on like, well, where does that, that second set of that extra pair of legs attach though, because everything else is just kind of standard. <laughs> right. Right. I, I look at things with wings a lot and, and think to myself, there's no way that's getting off the ground with wings that size. It's just not happening um, because people don't stop to consider that the, the size of the wing what it would have to be to lift something off the ground that's got more mass and more more weight uh, than the body of a bird. Um, that's pretty substantial because birds, even the size of, a, of an adult uh, large species eagle, only weigh about as much as a small bulldog. So it's not a lot to get off the ground. But if you're looking to get something like a horse, or a lion off the ground, or something based on those animals, like a pegasus or a griffin, those wings have to be enormous. And uh, artist Terrell Whitlatch works a lot with that. She actually works with paleontologists to uh, put together um, reconstructions of uh, pterosaurs. And then she uses what she learns from that, from the anatomy and the ratio of wing to body to create her own fantasy creatures in a way that's believable. And and her work is incredible. So what I'm getting from this is that I don't get my fancy Pegasus to ride around on. (laughs) You would get like a Chihuahua sized Pegasus. Pretty much. First, first Pegasus. Fresh my dreams. <laughs> I love it. I yeah, love I mean, it. I'll watch stuff because it's pretty. Like, I mean, Star Wars yeah. has very, very pretty artwork. And, like, I love the supplementary books they put out, just, like, looking at them. I love the concept art that goes into them. Mm-hmm. And, like, the... Like just watching the movies, I can almost do it on mute sometimes because it's just like beautiful, beautiful scenery. Yeah, I think what I like, what I think Star Wars, as much as I love Star Trek, what Star Wars does better is populating their worlds with yeah. a greater humanoid diversity, even though they, they still kind of tend to default towards humanoid without, you know, with, with a few exceptions. Um, the 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 species that have evolved into sentience and intelligence on different worlds um you can see that they have chosen lots of different ancestral lineages for that um so like you know even though a wookiee is substantially different than a human uh like the the they've they don't all just grow up to be like people with little decals on the sides of their head the way that we get in in star trek um uh so i like the way that they do that more and you know granted they're not they're not serializing they have a much bigger budget i understand that all those things come into play but i see that the creative risks there are are i think they pay off in a better way there's also like a depth of things that never even end up on the screen too it's like Mm -hmm. Or they're there for a, like a second. It's like, oh, oh, okay, that has a whole like story and thought behind it. Uh, I barely noticed it. Cool. Henson Studios, uh, when they put out the Dark Crystal in the '80s, um, they really worked hard on the world building for that. And I thought one of the most interesting decisions they made. Um, because they talked a lot about the um, biped with decals thing that, that Lolly was just mentioning. And they really wanted to avoid that, but they also wanted to make a believable world. So they started to look at things that they could subvert that would still be relatable to things in our own world um, and yet believable in the world they were creating. 
So in my opinion, one of the most interesting things that came out of that was they had plants that got up and moved around from place to place, which is perfectly reasonable to think about. And they had animals that were rooted to the ground. <laughs> um, and the, the creativity that came out of that one decision was really phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, you kind of get like, kind of get back to the topic a little bit, like the fact that they kind of thought out the whole ecology of the world adds to the richness of it. It makes it more believable. It's like, oh, I am immersed in this. Yeah. It's not just like, here's some stuff that look cool. We're just gonna throw it together and we're done. And it, like, it, as soon as you think, as you're kind of complaining about it, as soon as you think about it, it ends up being paper thin. It's like, after you leave the theater, it's like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, what stands out too about um, the Jim Henson Company in general is their, um, you know, the worlds that they que create aren't these mono ecologies. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend mm -hmm. to see that a lot in Star Wars and Star Trek, like, you know, a desert planet, a forest planet, an ocean planet, whereas uh, their worlds are, um, they're, they're very diverse in their landscapes and their ecologies and the, and changing from location to location and populating those spaces with different things. Yeah, if I had to pick one complaint about science fiction in general is that planet is one thing phenomena, especially like culturally, like, oh, okay, all the people from this planet are going to belong to one monolithic culture <laughs> with one climate. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing that tends to really throw me out of the story, actually. Yeah. So since we're talking about it, if you could pick, and this might be a good place to start to wrap it up. If you could pick your favorite bit of like science art in, in a, in your, in a fandom, what do you think that would be? I, you probably need a minute to think yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, or, uh, or, because there's, and there's so many, and it could be something small, like a, just a little glimpse of something that made you think about it for a while, or it could be something big, something that uh, uh, I'm gonna have to think about it for a while. It could be something big, something that like the whole premise is based on, uh, but that's well executed maybe in the, in the visual representation, the artistic representation, and also the scientific representation behind it. One of the projects that I'm keeping an eye on is the Saurian game. Um, and it's been ongoing and building and building and they've been doing stretch goals on their Kickstarter. Basically, they've created an immersive world where you can play a Cretaceous dinosaur. And they have worked so hard to make everything in there as up-to-date and scientifically accurate as possible. And they're constantly making changes because new papers are coming out day after day after day. Um, but the fandom that has been backing this project from day one, this is what they're here for. So they're gonna wait as long as it takes to get the game that they want because they know that it's gonna take time to get it there. The art is absolutely stunningly beautiful. Um, and it, it's clear that everybody is, is very passionate, as, as passionate about making the game as beautiful as it is accurate. And I, I just think it's a, a, a beautiful dovetailing of, of science and art in a way that, that's interactive and accessible. And I mean, who knows, since uh, we don't really know what's going on with the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World franchise these days, and there's a lot of opposing opinions about it, Saurian might be where the next generation of paleontologists starts. And I've got nothing bad to say about that. Nice. I need more time to Google because you asked me that I'm going like I have never seen a movie in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my mine is a little tiny thing. I mean, there's so many cool uh, effects and things like that, but mine is almost it's almost like a little throwaway thing. It's mentioned once in Farscape and then you never see it again, but it probably made me sit and think for a while. There's a scene where, so if you've never seen Farscape, this astronaut um, from a very near future, uh, basically modern day, ends up 
uh, across the galaxy, strange aliens. And it is a Jim Henson production. Uh, and he, he has no toothbrush. And so the aliens that he ends up with, they're like, well, just use a dentic. And it's like this little grub and they stick it in his mouth and the, the, you know, it's supposed to go in your mouth and it cleans your mouth. So the, the effect is incredibly well done. Uh, it, it's visual, it's tactile, it's believable by, by the act of putting it in your mouth, you can instantly envision what it is supposed to do right? That it'll crawl around your mouth and consume the debris that's accumulated on your teeth. And then there's a scene where Dargo, one of the aliens, grabs John and tells him, never swallow the dentic. And that right away made me sit back like, oh no. <laughs> like, like thinking about what could possibly happen to you if you were to swallow this thing and it had access to your entire digestive tract. And it's just a little throwaway. It's just a little nothing thing but the thought and and execution was incredibly well done and it's just one of my favorite moments of that series man i'm just sitting here thinking of all examples of where it's like uh, not quite right <laughs> like a tv show that i really enjoy is killjoys um oh. but i would definitely call it more of a science fantasy than science fiction because you hit a point where it's like there's the, the green goo that whole plot thing i'm going cool magic it's magic and i guess an example it's like there is just enough veneer of science to get you to the point that yes they're in space and there are spaceships and that's about it like honestly it could have taken place on one planet in a fantasy setting and i don't think you would have had to make significant plot changes so wait, I'm not familiar with this franchise. What's the green goo? Um, okay, so kill, so it is the substance that you can go into as like you're dreaming, but then also people can leave. It's there's not a good short explanation for this. It did not involve <laughs> watching two seasons of television. <laughs> I am so sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> Oh, no, I want to go and I want to go find out about it now. now. I'm curious. Yeah, no, now I mean, I'm going to go like, watch it and see. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very very entertaining TV show. It's basically about space bounty hunters before okay. it even gets to that point. But it is not something I would again. You you could have said it in on a in a fantasy world on one planet. It would have been fine. This the science fiction setting is mostly aesthetic, which is, which is neat and it's interesting. But it it was an aesthetic choice, not a scientific one. Well, and I think that kind of gets at the heart of what we're talking about is the idea of using, you know, you have this concept, you have a, you have science that is attached to that, that may be used to inform the concept, but then you have to sell that in a visual medium. Mm -hmm. And as a creator, they have to make choices about what they're going to include, what they're not, what, you know, in, in production how that's going to look on screen or in the video game or, or whatnot, right? So those editorial choices are incredibly important because it doesn't have to teach you. You're not trying to get a degree from watching a television show, <laughs> right? You just want to be immersed. And even if it's science fantasy, there's obviously still enough there, right? There's enough there there. Um, to sell it and to make you believe it and to make you say, okay, I accept that this is how things work in this particular universe and I'm willing to, to go along with the story, right? And that's kind of yeah. the magic of the science art relationship is the ability to take something that's factually true and make it sort of plastic and malleable and contort it in ways that we know don't really work, but that are still digestible. It's interesting yeah. to me because the thing that we're discussing now is science informing our art, which is around us all the time, you know, mm -hmm. movies, television shows, books, everywhere. And yet when we flip that script and talk about art informing science, there's this huge breakdown that people have about it. And well, it's, it's, it, that's so fascinating to me. Yeah, that just like we, occurred to me. Like we didn't quite get to it, but, um, the whole idea of like 
how you perceive things and how you convey information in a visual media, like it's, you're always editing things and you're always making choices. Like even the way your, like the way your eyes receive information, like it's flipped, I think twice from when it's like goes through the lens and through the optic nerve again. And like how you can tell something is in front of another thing. You have to be like, okay, like you're, there's a whole bunch of visual cues that like with overlap and like with the, how colors relate to each other that are, it's a lot of different information. And if you're conveying like a three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional space, you are deciding what information to include to represent that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's really two, two phases of editing information that are happening. There's in the creation of the object, there are editorial choices going on. And then in the consumption or the viewing mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the finished product, there are editorial things that are happening in our brains as we understand, as we seek to understand what's in front of us. That's pretty interesting. All right, well, it looks like we're just about out of time. I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in. We wish we could be there with you in person, but uh, we're very happy to share this online medium with you. And uh, if you have any comments, you know where to find us on Twitter uh, and on social media. Uh, so thanks for coming by.